Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Game Changer. I'm Maryam Zia. In today's program, we will be talking about the economic trajectory of Pakistan. As we know that uh, recently, in last week, IMF has uh, approved uh, $3 billion uh, for Pakistan. And uh, of course, as first tranche of $1.2 billion has been released to Pakistan as well. Uh, uh, besides this, uh, certain uh, bilateral partners of Pakistan like Saudi Arabia and UAE has also assisted Pakistan and Pakistan uh, Pakistan's economy is moving towards uh, better days and we will be talking about uh, what the IMF agreement means for Pakistan what sectors are going to be impacted uh, by this agreement we will be talking about the key challenges and also uh, the conditionalities that are attached to this agreement and what needs to be done when we talk about pakistan's economic revival we will be discussing uh, the economic revival uh, plan of pakistan uh, in today's program as well and what needs to be done to attract more foreign direct investments to pakistan what sectors uh, needs to be more focused on and how to diversify in uh, our economy. And to discuss this and more, we are joined in the studios by Mr. Shahjar Khan, who is an economist and expert in international affairs. Welcome to the program. We are also joined by Brigadier Hamid Malik, who is expert in international affairs and uh, senior analyst. Welcome to the program. And we are joined online by Dr. Stan Javed, who is economist and senior analyst. Welcome to the program. So let me start with you, uh, Mr. Shahjar, when we talk about this uh, recent development of Pakistan's economy that uh, IMF's agreement uh, has finally been approved and Pakistan has been negotiations uh, for quite some time now. Uh, so what are the immediate impacts and short term impacts on Pakistan's economy that you see after this uh, agreement? So Mariam, uh, this uh, IMF program comes at a very crucial time. Of course. So uh, this is a very good lifeline that has been given to the Pakistan economy mm -hmm. to manage uh, the crisis in the short term. And then it is like really dependent on the policymakers of Pakistan to develop a long-term uh, strategy on how to basically get out of this uh, multi-level crisis that Pakistan is going through. So Pakistan is going through an extremely high inflation. Other than that, we have like a lot of debt obligations. We have to like keep in mind that even in 2024 and 2025, Pakistan has to repay around 30 billion, uh, sorry, 20 billion dollars to external lenders. Of course. So uh, this uh, uh, current agreement. Uh, in the short term, it gives a very positive sentiment to the market and to the international lenders and creditors of Pakistan that Pakistan is on the road to recovery and Pakistan will be able to manage its debt obli obligations. Mm. On the other side, uh, internally, Pakistan has to uh, go through massive policy reforms, uh, massive long-term structural reforms and a lot of like uh, uh, government-related uh, uh, ventures to basically make Pakistan's institutions more sustainable and like more Right, uh, we will be discussing about these structural reforms as well in the program, but let's talk about this immediate dispersal of $1.2 billion mm -hmm. to Pakistan's economy. What is significance of this amount? So uh, this $1.2 billion, as soon as it's uh, uh, you know um, uh, given by the uh, IMF, it basically gives a positive sentiment to rest of, rest of the lenders mm -hmm. internationally. Very important. And we have to keep in mind that uh, a lot of our mm. uh, uh, historic partners or very close uh, brotherly countries like Saudi Arabia, uh, Dubai, uh, UAE, GCC countries, they basically predicated uh, the efforts or uh, the support that they would be giving to Pakistan's economy uh, if Pakistan basically goes through the IMF program and basically uh, fulfills the con conditionalities that are needed to basically uh, get this loan of 1.2. So now that this has been given to Pakistan, it gives a positive sentiment to the other, uh, you know, historic partners of Pakistan to basically come to Pakistan's uh, support. This also gives a positive sentiment in the international bond market as well. Mm -hmm. As soon as the this uh, loan was uh, dispersed, you you saw like the Pakistan stock exchange. It started like performing at historic levels in the highest in the last 15 years. Other than that, Pakistan's bonds in the international market they rose in value as well. So that like kind of like shows that a positive sentiment is emerging in terms of Pakistan's uh, growth and recovery. Right. So what sectors do you think are going to be impacted most or are going to be benefited most when we talk about this immediate uh, dispersal of 1.2 billion uh, dollars to Pakistan's economy? Uh, first of all, we must understand that this is an uh, interim relief which has been given to our economy. Hmm. Till this the is a breather, we just a breather. Uh, first of all, balance of payment crisis hmm. is going to be mitigated. We will not be compressed to pay back our debt. But at the same time, what we need to do is that we must have some policies geared up 
so that our GDP has a boost. And if we see our GDP, the percentage of GDP coming from industries are almost 24%, and from agriculture is 11%. These are the two sectors which need to be given some boost so that our GDP gets a boost. And when our GDP will get a boost, our balance of payment crisis will be not there. What is happening now, that if we are earning 80 rupees and we are spending 120 rupees, now the difference of these spending and our earning is what is the problem of our economy. And if we have our GDP geared up on substantial basis from industry as well as from agriculture, these are two aspects. And recently, the initiative taken by the federal government, what we see that the establishment of Special Investment Facilitation Council, and then also having some measures taken to revitalize our industry as well as our agriculture. And agriculture is also among the focus now by the federal government. And Pakistan Army is also contributing a lot towards the agriculture. There. And I think uh, the recent initiative by the Chief of Army mm, staff, greener that now Greener Pakistan, and giving all out support to the farmers and to the government. Mm to the provincial as well as the federal government, I think this will go a long way. Of course. And uh, getting this uh, reserve and utilizing it f basically to enhance our earning would should be the aim of the government and focus of the government. Also. Of course. So this is very important that the sectors that have been neglected for a long time are going to be focused uh, when we talk about uh, utilizing uh, these funds. But Dr. Sen, uh, this is very important that there are certain conditionalities when we talk about this IMF agreement. Can you tell us about the timeline of uh, these conditions and how do you see that the government and the subsequent government, because uh, we see that elections are going to be happening in uh, in the country. Uh, so uh, how do you see that uh, governments uh, and the uh, incumbent government is going to implement uh, those conditions? And what would be the challenges? See, I mean, the timing of the IMF uh, is very crucial in a moment like, for example, the political and the economic. Uh, we must have to differentiate between the economic side and the political side. In, in Pakistan, the whole pivot is around the uh, uh, political stability, and it is very much important, and that's what we don't have. Uh, even after the uh, IMF, the, only the global impact is coming. Of course, the global impact and what we are uh, seeking for, as Gadir Saab is uh, pointing out, uh, the SIFC, and the Green Initiative Program by the Pakistan military. I really appreciate this program because the target is $100 billion of foreign direct investment. For that reason, IMF, uh, the coming of IMF with 1.2 uh, billion of the, uh, the first tranche, this means that uh, the foreign confidence will come. And the, the international companies, uh, especially on the large scale manufacturing and the agriculture mechanization by the China, by the European Union, by the other uh, lenders, they will come uh, forward to it. But the most important part in that area, the you have talked about the political situation. Uh, I am completely uh, against this, um, I mean, upcoming elections because there is a complete instability. Because if there is an instability, if there is, they are starting the fund, uh, for uh, uh, FIC, uh, SIFC plan, then foreign direct investment plan. So, uh, Brigadier, uh, Brigadier Sab, how do you see that uh, this IMF deal is going to impact the development sector of Pakistan, especially how this is going to impact the common citizen of Pakistan? Of course, the purchasing power of pa uh, pa uh, common citizen of, uh, or Pakistani is going to be impacted by this. Uh, I think this is the most important aspect of this deal. Also. Mm, of but course. commonly, what we see mm. with the palace of payment and Trade deficit. Because immediate impact may not be going to the citizen. Uh, it will not trickle down mm. to the common of man course. straight away, but in longer term. Mm. Actually, this deal is not only about the money which we get. It yeah. is about the fiscal discipline which we are asked to do. Now, if we are, uh, go for the fiscal discipline, what is that? It is that, that our spending should be as per our earning. And we should not uh, go into the more spending on the non-development aspect of the expenditure. Second aspect of it is that when we have got better balance of payment, there will be less burden on our rupee. And we have seen the, the moment we got some stunts from the Saudi Arabian government, that mm -hmm. is $2 billion, $1 billion from, from UAE. UAE, and also from the IMF, 
now see the depreciation of the dollar about 15 rupees and it is straight away impacting the common man mm -hmm. second is that they recently we have seen depreciation in the petroleum prices also which is going to straight away give benefit to the common man because when government have something in kitty it can provide to the people it can go for the social development for its public it can go for the poverty alleviation and we don't have any pressure for the foreign reserve also of course because these are things which are interconnected because the right. financial health of the government and the prosperity of the common man they are intermingled interlinked right. so the uh, effect is not straight away but after right. some but this time is a the effect, effect comes effect down well. the snowball effect comes down and also it trickles down Sometimes people say that the trickling effect is not that much which should have been. Hmm, not but that if, much visible. But we but see in sincerity, we see the development of our country 10 years back, 20 years back, we have come a long way. If we see the development in the major cities and development in the in, uh, villages also, energy sector also, industry also. But if we say we are a developing country, so this is a ongoing process. Of we course. need to be little, uh, as far as uh, industries and more technical oriented, we have more vocational schools coming in so that we have the skilled manpower. And there are many good news is as far as Pakistan is concerned. Of we course. are going for the, uh, I think, uh, development of our industry, development of our agriculture. We have IT sector, which is very booming. Of and, course, and, and energy sector is also going to be impacted. We need there to be a little patient. Of course, this is going to create a snowball effect when we talk about reaching its impacts down to the uh, common citizen as well. Uh, but Dr. Sen, when we talk about uh, uh, its immediate impacts, let's talk about how this is going to impact the stability of banking sector and how that is going to impact Pakistan's economic stability. First, we need to understand that uh, the GDP stood at 0.3 in to, 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 to 200, uh, I mean, in 22 to 23, against the target of 5%. So the government has set uh, its target to 35.3.5 uh, uh, GDP target to the next f fiscal year. So the most top important thing is the size of the country economy shrank to uh, uh, 341.50 billion, and the per capita income is also decreased to uh, uh, 1568 this year in the fiscal uh, year. So the consumer price index, uh, index uh, as per the uh, 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 report is uh, was recorded by 29.2. Uh, so inflation rose to the fresh record uh, high of the 38.0 in May. So the issue moved from the current level later uh, this calendar year is on the weak domestic demand, but the recent removal of the currency control and the refusal uh, and the fuel subsidies will uh, keep it far above in the 10 years average of 8.0. Uh, so uh, key risks include extreme weather events and the currency weakness and the wallet, uh, uh, volatile commodity price. It also uh, comes in that matter. But uh, the very important thing is the total revenue, fiscal deficit, the current account and the overall current account uh, uh, posted a deficit which is about 32.3.2 uh, billion from July and April of 2023. Mm -hmm. So against uh, a deficit of the 13.6. So in that way, the banking channel must have getting the strength if the, there is a input of the IMF, but it cannot give to the small and medium enterprise. It will, uh, I mean, of course, are into the large scale manufacturer or the agriculture plan, but that could not be, I mean, going to uh, directly facilitate the uh, people of Pakistan. But of course, we have to make the policy as uh, FICS uh, uh, or, or the foreign direct investment plan is going on. But the tax collection is very much important. Uh, before the banking channel, the important question to put on is the FBI tax collection, which we increased by 16.1% uh, during the July. And the uh, provincial net tax collection uh, grew by 6.1%, which is a huge, like, for example, it is five, six, three, uh, seven point nine billion. It is a huge of the huge of the price what we uh, taken up, and the e sale uh, tax grew by one point two, and the FDI is total uh, uh, FED is about the nine point eight percent. So work and rem remittance is also growing down, which is uh, I mean like for example work and remittance recorded at. 22.7 billion and uh, it, which is about the 26.1 billion last year decreased by 13.0 and the mem uh, mom remittance is decreased by 12.8 percent we have to establish this 
uh, uh, area by the State Bank of Pakistan that uh, the remittance must gain up so that the uh, foreign direct investment goes up. Of In course, that, that is very important. The foreign direct that is very important. So, how do you see that this IMF agreement aligns with is, Pakistan? Right. So, uh, Dr. Sen, how do you see that this IMF so, agreement aligns with Pakistan's own uh, broader uh, economic development plans and economic strategies? So, th th this is th this is very much important thing to discuss on. For example, IMF uh, is giving us a, a, a breather. It is from the zero point two. Uh, for example, if we expect from the IMF expected the global economy to grow the two point eight percent, followed by the three point zero, which is uh, ideal deal. Uh, and uh, if I talk about the impact, the more withholding tax never be for, uh, refunded. So charges and levy on the essential goods such as or myers even through employment and investment growth now this is the, uh, the area where we have to talk on and then when the government misses the fiscal target the funds and the pakistan uh, finance minister, uh, ministry agree on the quarterly mini budget which often include new taxes on a school fee, bank transaction, internet access, and so forth. So uh, uh, let me tell you about that 0.6% on the banking transaction on the 50,000. Uh, uh, I, I am literally, uh, I, I request uh, to the finance department that they should uh, consider this uh, point that uh, it should not be, it should be waived from this, this uh, even yeah, under the IMF circumstances. Of course, citizens. we must need to understand this whole financial structure is given by IMF, not by the finance ministry. And this whole financial burden and most of the most important is the IPP structure and the reforms in the uh, uh, in the private sector or the uh, public sector uh, or, or what I call it as uh, state-owned enterprises. It is the biggest uh, uh, point to, be, uh, to, to, to have a reform on it. But the important thing is, moreover, alongside dictionary tax, uh, 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 is it, uh, tax policies, the IMF has forced the finance ministry into unplanned spending cuts without uh, any real reforms, despite the obvious negative effect uh, this has grown. And when such reductions were made under the IMF program in 1990, uh, so Pakistan National Bus Service ended up on the uh, chopping block and the vehicle were allowed to uh, deteriorate. And since then, the funding for the public service, including railway policy, health and education, has been cut to bone. So we must have to focus on these areas and f f most important, the long run experiment on austerity and the hastily designed spending cuts have undermined growth and thus the government fiscal position forcing to kill off the public service and the infrastructure projects. That result has been served uh, uh, erosion of the state capacity. But uh, 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 there are many other reforms, if you will ask uh, in the later stage, I'll talk about the of reforms, course, of course, uh, which that is, is very needed important to and, by uh, the IMF. Of course, Dr. Sen, when we talk about these conditionalities attached to IMF programs, Pakistan has gone to IMF um, uh, around 23 times, and only one time Pakistan has implemented all the uh, measures or condi conditions imposed by IMF. So this is very important that uh, what challenges the country would be facing when we talk about implementation. We'll be talking more about it, but after short break. Welcome back. We are talking about economic trajectory of Pakistan. And of course, when we talk about IMF agreement, there are certain challenges when we talk about implementation of certain measures or conditions imposed uh, by IMF as well. So, Mr. Shahyar, when we talk about this uh, bailout package, of course, this is very significant for Pakistan. But let's talk about the conditions that how, what challenges that the country would be facing to implement those conditions and what indicators IMF would be using uh, to check or to ensure the transparency of the, you know, <coughs> the bailout package that is being utilized in different sec sectors. So, Mariam, first of all, to analyze how basically the IMF develops its policy, mm. it is very imperative to understand that IMF works with a neoliberal economic model. In a neoliberal, neoliberal economic model, there is no space for subsidies. And whatever a country earns, it has to spend and its uh, fiscal limitations have to be kept in mind. 
Um, other countries like do it differently, but their economies are also very strong. So when they provide subsidies, those subsidies are covered in some other way in sorts of like a revenue generation that takes place in some other sectors of the economy. So Pakistan, uh, when uh, fulfilling IMF's uh, conditionalities, it had to forego of all the subsidies that it was giving uh, to the common citizen. So this basically also covered uh, uh, the prices of energy, petrol, and uh, oil that we basically saw. And that had an inflationary effect on Pakistan's uh, economy. So inflation basically rose because of two reasons. First, because of the rising demand in Pakistan's uh, economy. Mm -hmm. Other than that, the international oil prices and the uh, conditionalities that were worsened because of the Russia's invasion mm -hmm. to Ukraine. Other of course, than that, global uh, financial global, fluctuations yeah. also impact so this Pakistan's economy. Uh, inflation that Pakistan mm -hmm. is going through, it's not just Pakistan, mm -hmm. Turkey is going through it, the rest of the developing, impact. it's a global, uh, global phenomena Phenomenal. right now, induced by the Russian war, before that it was COVID, and we have to remember that Pakistan went through massive like floods, uh, climate-induced disasters as well. So all of these poly crises all at once basically affected Pakistan's economy. And that is why Pakistan is like now mm. trying its best to get out of this crisis that it was going through. Now in the short term, this uh, uh, benefit will not be trans uh, translated to the common man. Right. You know? So that is like unfortunate. And in the long term, there will be in benefit definitely. We have to like keep in mind another thing that when it comes to the energy sector of Pakistan, Energy, energy sector in Pakistan is making losses of over 1.3 trillion rupees. Do you know how much that translates into dollars? It's like over 12 billion dollars. You know, this is the uh, uh, circular debt that Pakistan is like uh, accumulating. To make all of these public sector enterprises more efficient, Pakistan has to implement uh, reforms, structural reforms that would take like at least like five to six years to uh, get all of these things in order. I am a, a firm proponent of privatization and a lot of these private sector, uh, uh, public sector enterprises that are making losses of for course. the last like 15 to 20 we all, years. We, we it's keep about on discussing time. this in yes, our we programs discuss as it, well. And we discuss it in every government as well. Of course. Every government that comes in, they have a mandate and they basically say we will privatize all of these mm. uh, state entities, state-owned enterprises. State -owned enterprises and that are like bearing losses over losses mm -hmm. for the Pakistan people. Pakistan people are paying taxes and those right. taxes so are being... So let's talk about uh, the indicators that IMF is going to use uh, mm -hmm. to uh, to monitor that how Pakistan is going to implement uh, all the conditionalities and also mm -hmm. is IMF going to provide some technical expertise to Pakistan to ensure uh, the implementation of all the conditions because as uh, I told earlier that you know 23 times Pakistan has gone to IMF but only one time uh, all the conditions were fulfilled that was in 2013 to 2016 when we went to IMF. So Maria, this is a question between uh, politics and economics. Mm -hmm. So this is like something where Pakistani politicians and policy makers will have to balance on where they want to like do politics and where they, they want to do structural economic reforms. Even when fulfilling uh, the IMF condi conditionalities this time around, uh, we had to uh, basically place over 385 billion rupees worth of taxes to the common man. You know, and this was one of the fiscal requirements that IMF basically put in uh, for, uh, you know, the uh, and e even in the budget that was like passed. So we had to fulfill this obligation. Now, where is this 385, uh, you know, billion rupees coming from? It's like extra taxes that the people of Pakistan will have to pay to basically uh, fulfill this uh, demand. So in the sh uh, and now the your question, what will IMF be basically assessing mm -hmm. Pakistan's economy? What indicators on? are they? So it will be tax collection. Right. So the biggest uh, support that we need is in terms of tax reforms, reforming the tax structure of Pakistan. So FBR is already getting a lot of technical assistance from the World Bank and various multilateral institutions. But are those reforms enough, or are they sincere enough to translate? into larger tax collection or more progressive tax collection. There are like various uh, segments in Pakistan's economy that are not under taxation. It's like agriculture, it's uh, you know, uh, the mercantile class, they don't, do not like pay taxes. So we will have to distribute and like bring these sectors that historically have been um, exempted from the taxes. And what happens is that we have to like tax more when it comes to electricity. The electricity is getting more expensive which is not good for business as well. Common man will already be paying for it, but industries will also be paying for it. Other than that, uh, because our inflation rate is like, uh, was uh, at a highest of like 40%, increasing the commodity prices, then IMF did push Pakistan's state bank to increase the policy rate up to 22%. 
Now, the 22% policy rate is not conducive for in investment. It is not condu conducive to like take finances to start businesses True. because people would want to keep their money in the banks mm. to get this uh, return uh, of like 22%. Right. So this uh, uh, monetary policy is generally uh, placed to basically control and curb inflation. But how long would we want this policy rate to stay at this level? Because this is not conducive for any investment. So these are like certain uh, policy reforms that uh, IMF will be testing Pakistan on, the floating exchange rate, which uh, also is uh, very controversial when it comes to developing countries. Of course. As soon as the dollar-rupee parity increases, our uh, debt repayments increase as well. Has it a negative impact on Pakistan's economy in terms of imports that Pakistan does? Pakistan does a lot of imports, especially oil imports. Oil prices have a very direct impact on how right. the economy uh, propagates. Of course, and that keeps on fluctuating and exactly. that is going to be impacting Pakistan's economy as well. Dr. Stan, uh, let's talk about some of uh, the key internal uh, challenges that are impacting Pakistan's economy and also the external shocks uh, that keep on uh, uh, hindering Pakistan's economic growth. And uh, what measures do you think government needs to implement uh, to attract more uh, foreign direct investment to Pakistan? So, so uh, in, in first come first, I would like to, uh, I mean, uh, uh, answer you the second part of your question, and then I'll come on to the first part of the question. The solution towards this is the only solution is the committing to a long-term reformative economic strategy, and the SIFC is a stepping toward it. So, uh, steadfast policy implementation is a key for the Pakistan to overcome its current challenge, including through the greater fiscal discipline market determined exchange rate to absorb external pressure which is very very much important no more currency control no more currency control please let the dollar uh, go organic uh, uh, further progress on reforms particularly in the energy sector and let me tell you about the energy sector it is 2.63 trillion and uh, not uh, uh, about uh, 1.6 trillion it is more than that and the government is paying about 400 billion for the uh, creating, uh, I mean, uh, negotiating the loss with the discos and discos. And now the further uh, uh, to promote the climate resilient and to improve the business climate. Now, a very much important thing is uh, to how many, I mean, uh, the problems that we are facing is since the completion of the combined seventh and eighth review under the uh, 2019 extended fund facility in August 22, the economy has faced several external shocks, which is uh, uh, from the uh, uh, inflation uh, to authorities to the uh, other factors like duplicating of the, uh, I mean, uh, 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 the, of the structures, for example, the ministries. But the reforms we need to alternate, uh, which is given by the IMF, is, uh, to overcome the Pakistan constant power shortage have been discussed for the last decades, and yet the losses continue to mount. Uh, with the cost of mismanagement passed on it is a form of price increase. The uh, total circular debt, which I told you, is about the 2.67 trillion. And the pattern is always the same, which need to avoid all, at all the cost. With the fund blessing and the government goes on the shopping spree and uh, taking out costly loans of the expensive project, thus building up on the more debt and adding new uh, inefficiencies. After a few years, other crises ensure it met by another IMF program. So right. if we are going for another IMF program, that could be another problem. So, uh, I mean, rapidly achieving the stable macroeconomic indicator, it is uh, right. it is a matter, even if doing so accelerate the social and political uh, decay. So, uh, uh, of course, Dr. Sain, when we talk about uh, the growth in uh, uh, Pakistan's foreign exchange reserves, how do you think that is going to impact the macroeconomic stability of Pakistan? See, I mean, uh, foreign reserves, as far as foreign reserves, the foreign direct investment is very much important and necessary point is the agriculture. And the second is the large scale manufacturing. We have to, uh, I mean, uh, uh, put uh, our uh, large scale manufacturing on to the scale because when we talk about the small and medium enterprise, when we talk about the slaughtery, uh, if I talk about, give you the number about the slaughtery, it is 0.9%. We have very uh, bad, uh, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, structure for the small and medium enterprises. So, uh, for for the for the very short run, we have to focus on the large scale manufacturing. But we have to give them the multinational companies as the exemption for the tax holidays and the uh, tax uh, reduction. 
not for as for example we are giving the 3% to the 6% and then we the, uh, otherwise the most of the company from the has code to other companies or the shell uh, uh, or the multinational other companies or the automobile companies if they go back we cannot survive so we must have to target the large scale manufacturing and the most important right. is the agriculture uh, mechanization so agriculture can give us and uh, the boost to the economy and let me tell you and let me assure you if we give the most a potential and most focus and most uh, a memorandum of understanding with the china and the agriculture mechanization between the china and pakistan and of course within the russia uh, we can export more and more uh, i mean uh, under the dairy and the agriculture area so that uh, our uh, i mean fdi will uh, of course improve in a better of way of course of course and this is very important for pakistan to uh, 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 increase uh, fdi as well uh, so when we talk about uh, attracting foreign direct investments uh, how do you think what should be uh, government's vision or pakistan's vision for an economic centric foreign policy and of course we talk about that uh, saudi arabia and uae uh, has assisted pakistan uh, have assisted pakistan uh, recently uh, what needs to be done to attract more uh, multilateral development partners uh, for pakistan's financial assistance uh, before answering your question i would first like to highlight what are the feelings of a common man right because we have seen economic meltdown for the last 5 years right and we have seen dollar soaring from 120 to 280 mm. or even going to 300 and at the same time we have seen fleeting investment opportunities for right. local pakistanis as far as the foreign direct investment is concerned mm. so uh, we think now it is a silver lining which a common man sees that pakistan government is now acting upon how to address our meltdown and in that case what you said that it is interlinked the common man has to get some benefit from the economic policies of the government and of if course. it is not there the money coming to pakistan if we see that is going to have a very uh, i must say positive impact on our economy it will move our wheel it will have a more confidence for multilateral as well as bilateral <coughs> our friends so that they can come to pakistan and the foreign direct investment coming to pakistan will have a ripple effect for the welfare of the people also but at the same time we should be uh, cognizant of the fact that our policies has to be geared in that way true and two of my companion has very amply highlighted that what needs to be done in short term as well as the long term now the government needs to be honest need to be very focused that these policies are geared in the right direction we have recently seen greener pakistan initiative we have seen establishment of the special investment facilities and council these are the steps in the right direction right these are going to impact our economy these are going to give a long standing i must say the policy framework and the strategy framework now coming over to the foreign uh, policy also that the country need to also be cognizant when you have a strong economy your influence will be more mm. people will be coming to more but at the same time for strong economy you have to have certain sectors highlighted for the foreign direct investment of course like we have also talked about that one is it mm. second is agriculture and also the large scale manufacturing units we have also taken initiative from the cpac that we have established special economic zone it should not be only restricted to china china right. has a long standing trend has helped us a lot it should be made open to the globe and we should ask other countries to also come and invest in those economic zone and our taxation policy should be such because when you get into d you have to accept certain regulations which of may course. not be going straight away for the benefit of your economy so there has to be a very fine balance made by the government that certain sector should be given some tax incentives special course, areas should be given tax incentives and also problem with pakistan is that for common man what i am going to express that direct taxation is too less and what happens that indirect taxation takes into the gap hmm. and we have seen that sales are going up to 18 and 25% it affects badly to the common man of course it and affects badly and we in, uh, need some measures uh, to create uh, a climate that is friendly for investors as well so what measures are needed do you think uh, to create a business friendly environment 
Uh, for domestic as well as for uh, you know foreign <coughs> in investments as well. So, Mariam, I'll uh, talk about domestic first. So, uh, the whole uh, philosophy or thought process be behind the SIFC. A lot of people are asking what time, what is different this time around. Mm. So, SIFC is basically following a very simple model. It's something that we have been talking about in our previous programs. It's a policy consistent charter of economy that we keep on discussing. A charter of economy in which all political stakeholders, bureaucratic stakeholders, and all the policy makers of Pakistan basically come together and they develop policy that is consistent and policy in which everyone agrees. And that is like very necessary in terms of uh, making Pakistan an investment hub. So this consistency in policy, we have a good example of NCOC mm -hmm. when the COVID crisis of was course. hitting Pakistan. And we saw that uh, NCOC had stakeholders from the military, economics, other than that, various ministries that were the frontline ministries when it came to uh, handling that crisis, right. and COC played a very important right. role. Right, and they coordinated. They coordinated. Well. So now, to basically bring about a charter of economy, all of these stakeholders are coming together again to develop policies to invest, uh, to attract investments to Pakistan. So that is what Pakistan is doing in the, and they have like uh, noted down various uh, sectors that will they will be focusing on to uh, develop and attract investment to Pakistan. Other than that, on the uh, international front, we have to see whether Pakistan is an investment hub and how we can basically b attract investment to Pakistan. One, ease of doing business is very important. Is it easy to uh, start a company in Pakistan? Is the taxation system of Pakistan transparent? Uh, are there any bureaucratic or regulatory hurdles for bringing investments to Pakistan? Other than that, do we provide a one-stop shop? for people to, of or course. will they have to go to like 25 different mm. departments to get their mm. uh, no objection certificates? All the red tapism all and the bureaucratic red tapism. hurdles. So all of these issues have to be addressed and we have been doing this. Uh, Board of Investment is working on it. Uh, Ministry of uh, uh, Commerce and Trade has been working on it. But all of these efforts need to be consolidated. And I believe SIFC has the mandate and the right stakeholders to make that a possibility. Right. So, Dr. Sen, lastly, uh, tell us that what needs to be done to implement the economic revival plan that, that is uh, the key to Pakistan's economic prosperity. Uh, frankly, the f uh, finance ministry or the planning div uh, division or the, uh, I mean, board of investment, m uh, I mean, uh, of course, they, they, w w uh, I mean, SIFC has the biggest question mark on all these departments because uh, the planning division and the Board, Invest, Board of Investment, even the Ministry of Commerce uh, have not done the basic structural policy development uh, incurred to the, uh, uh, to the, uh, for the development. But, uh, but for uh, another reason, the IMF now instructed the State Bank of Pakistan and we must have to follow the State Bank uh, regulations. So State Bank of Pakistan has withdrawn the guidance on the importance pr uh, prioritization and uh, is committed to ensure the full market determination the, uh, uh, on the exchange rate. And uh, please, uh, I request the foreign ministry uh, to uh, do not disturb the exchange rate. If they disturb the exchange rate, e even the base point from the 100 point to sometime on around the 150 to uh, 200, then the whole of the currency control problem will ensure you the dollar increase. So the State Bank of Pakistan should remain proactive to reduce inflation and maintain the foreign exchange framework free to restriction on the payments and transfer of the current international transaction and multiply currency practices. Continue efforts to mobilize the finance support uh, from the multilateral uh, institution and bilateral partners. And in addition to the generous uh, climate related uh, pledges from the climate resilient Pakistan, the government yeah, is focused on the obtaining new financial and secure to the rollover of the debt falling uh, due. So which is very much important, we are just taking the rollovers on the basis of the calamity. And of course, we must have to uh, remain this uh, replenished gross reserve with the aim of bringing them more comfortable level. And last but not least, very important uh, point I am going to have it. The government has also decided to strengthen the uh, valid, val uh, availability uh, of the energy sector, including through timely on the annual uh, rebasing and improving SOE governance and strengthening the public investment management framework which is very much important, very important and of very course, important, the of course. implementation of the program and the critical to its success in the light of the difficult challenges. Right. Thank you very much, Dr. Sen Javed, for joining us in today's program. Thank you very much, Mr. Shahyar Khan, for being with us in today's program. Thank you very much, uh, Brigadier Hamid Malik, for joining us in today's program. Of course, in today's program, we talked about uh, the recent IMF bailout 
out package and what it means for Pakistan, what challenges uh, the country might face when we talk about implementation of the conditionalities attached with this IMF agreement. Of course, when we talk about Pakistan's geopolitical and economic potential, the potential is huge, possibilities are huge. Uh, and of course, uh, we know about this important economic revival plan and we all need to get together uh, and with coordination, we can take country out of this economic crisis. And we are moving towards that. That's all from Game Changer tonight. Take care. Allah.